in the crime of rape. Sweden, Britain, Belgium, Norway, Israel, Denmark, Spain, France, Russia, Canada, Japan, and Germany all lead Libya. If Libya has, if he has lost the moral right to lead his people, what about you? What about homelessness? The rate in Britain is nearing 8%. In France, they estimate that 200,000 people live on the streets. In America, there are nearly a million living under bridges, homeless. We save America for last because America started all this. You are the one that called for such action, and you maneuvered this resolution 1973 through the Security Council and fought for it and were the proudest when it passed. You are the one that called for Gaddafi to step down and leave his country, and you are the first to say that he has lost the moral right to lead Libya, and you are the first to call for his assassination. Well, America, you are hemorrhaging jobs. Nearly 8 million jobs were lost in this latest recession. America now has 15 million unemployed, and when you add to that the underemployed, it comes to nearly 20 million Americans. 44 million Americans now live below the poverty level, and that is rising. A full one-third of American families tasted poverty for at least a couple of months last year. That's 100 million Americans. And the number of households collecting emergency food aid is now nearing 6 million. Approximately one in eight, million, uh, eight American people are, are using food stamps. Three million U.S. properties went into foreclosure in 2010 alone, a record high. And the number of families in homeless shelters or forced to live with extended family or friends is nearing one million. 50 million Americans have no health insurance, and that's 17% of the total U.S. population. 68 adults in America die each day in the U.S. due to the lack of health insurance. And what about your veterans, America? Those whom you send to fight your unjust wars. How do they fare when they return home? The Pentagon says that one in five American soldiers are returning from the war zones with some form of traumatic brain injury. Still others suffer emotional trauma. About 130,000 veterans become homeless each year in the United States, and more than half are black and Hispanic. The Veterans Administration estimates that 107,000 veterans are homeless on any given night. Suicide rates, divorce, and drug dependency are alarmingly high and worsening among America's veterans. Your infrastructure is even worse off than your citizens. A full one quarter of the nation's bridges are structurally dangerous. Seven billion gallons of clean water leak out of your crumbling pipes every day, while billions of gallons of raw sewage pours into your lakes and rivers. According to your engineers, it will take $2.2 trillion to fix this problem. Your record, America, stinks in the nostrils of God. You who, in the name of humanitarian efforts, want to save the population of Libya, Save them from whom and from what? How many Libyans are living in poverty? What's the crime rate in Libyan society in comparison to you who condemn Muammar Gaddafi? How many homes has he built for his people? How many of his people are living under bridges? No Libyan lives in poverty, not one. The crime rate in Libyan society is nothing in comparison to those of you who condemn him and his rule of Libya. He has built hundreds of thousands and into the millions of homes for his people. No Libyan is homeless. No Libyan is living under a bridge. Why are you angry with him? What has he done to bring down on him the wrath of the West? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me, the three most hated of men are one, a rich man who gives away his wealth to the poor, a wise man who shares his knowledge with the ignorant, and the man to whom 
the Holy Quran is revealed. Why do you hate Gaddafi? Does he share the wealth of Libya with the poor? Well, if he does, and he does, doesn't that make you, America, look bad? <laughs> you are the richest nation on the earth, and you've got 44 million people living in poverty, bread lines, food lines, food stamps, children suffering in America, but you want to talk to Gaddafi about humanitarian concerns? Gaddafi believes that economic democracy can only be achieved when the GDP of a country benefits all its citizens and when the country's wealth is dispersed to every single citizen. One journalist who lived in Libya wrote of the accomplishments Libya has made under the leadership of Muammar Gaddafi. This uh, journalist is Brother Gerald A. Pereira from uh, Guyana. Listen to what he says and see if you can defeat the truth of what he has said. Number one, Gaddafi nationalized Libya's vast oil resources and used his influence within OPEC to negotiate fairer prices for oil producing countries. Two, Gaddafi used the oil revenue to build schools, hospitals, universities, and infrastructure. Three, he raised the literacy rate from 20% when he became the leader and now it is 83%. Libya has one of the finest health care systems in the third world. All people have access to doctors, hospitals, clinics, and medicines free of charge. If a Libyan needs surgery that is unavailable in Libya, funding is provided for that surgery to be carried out overseas. He raised the life expectancy from 44 years now to 75. Basic food items were subsidized and electricity was made available throughout the country. He spent billions on the man-made river where he brought his engineers, brought water up out of the desert. And now pipelines run from Benghazi and Tobruk almost to the door of Tunisia. This man has set up irrigation projects which were established in order to support a drive toward agricultural development and food self-sufficiency. Any Libyan who wanted to become a farmer was and still is given free use of land, a house, farm equipment, livestock, and seed. Gaddafi vowed that his own parents who lived in a tent in the desert would not be housed until every Libyan was housed. He fulfilled that promise. Under Gaddafi, Libya has now attained the highest standard of living in Africa. Listen to this. Money from Libya's oil revenue is deposited into the bank account of every Libyan. Women have full access to education, employment, and he has enabled women to serve in the armed forces. This is most important. Gaddafi was the first and only leader in the Arab world to formally apologize for the Arab role in the trade in captured Africans. Gaddafi acknowledged that the black Africans were the true owners of Libya and proclaimed in his green book, the black race shall prevail throughout the world. Pereira writes, imperialists fear a united Africa which would completely alter the balance of power globally. The well-documented fact is that if Africa stopped the flow of all resources and raw materials to the Western nations for just one week, the United States and Europe would grind to a halt. Nelson Mandela, the one whom you claim you love, called Muammar Gaddafi one of the 20th century's greatest freedom fighters and insisted the eventual collapse of the apartheid system owed much to Gaddafi and Libyan support. With no justification, real justification, you put Libya under sanctions for 10 years. He couldn't buy this or that from this country or that. So he was forced to turn inward and under sanctions he has a produced a country in which everything in it is paid for. It has no debt. Then the ultimate crime of Muammar Gaddafi 
was to tie the Libyan dinar to gold. Even more than Russia, he's only has, uh, China is the only one that has more gold than Libya, according to what we have read. The gold that Libya amassed shows that her country has been based on solid economic principles. But America, Europe, look at you. America is now drowning in $62 trillion of debt if you include Social Security, Medicare, and other entitlements. Well, now, media, what is your responsibility? If I know this, if others know this, if men like Wesley Clark, Attorney General, and Sister Dorothy McKinney, McKinney and others speak out. If the Congress voted against giving this government more money to continue this wicked plot against Libya and the Libyan people, whether they're in Benghazi or in Tripoli, I am telling my brothers in Benghazi that the Western world does not intend to give you justice. They will use you, and in the end, they will suck your blood. They have gathered like vultures, and they'll pick your blood as soon as they finish picking his. Well, media, if you know this, why don't the American people know this? It's because our media is controlled. Management of the news to support policies that are wicked. This was done in the lead up to the war in Iraq. If truth were given to the American people, the American people would never have supported these policies. You are no longer a free press, and you are doing a great disservice to the American people. And I am warning you, you will pay a price for this because the American people can only be lied to for so long. But it is written in both the Bible and the Quran. In the Bible it says everything that is done in the dark will come to the light. And in the Quran it says, though it be the weight of an atom hidden in a rock and buried in the earth, yet will Allah bring it forth. So your days of lying are over. Your days of deceiving people all over the world are over. Truth will come out in the end, and it will cause a revolt in the American people against all these institutions which have misused and abused their loyalty and their love for the United States of America. Now, you don't like that Brother Gaddafi is more interested in the welfare of others and does not hoard the wealth of Libya for Libyans alone? He began to show his people why they should be concerned for their neighbors and the suffering of their fellow neighbors, whether it is in the Arab world or in Africa or in other parts of the world. He made his people through the Green Book international in their thinking. In 1999, Muammar Gaddafi decided to foster the ideas of Asadjifo, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, and Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt for a United States of Africa. This created great concern. Among who? America, England, France, Italy, Germany, Canada, all of you that have sucked the blood and continue to suck the blood of the poor and weak of this earth. What was your concern about that? If there were United States of Africa with one central bank, with a transportation system that tied all these nations together with one language that they would adopt and as the official language of all 53 countries, with trade between the states and with those outside of America, with one great army, and they're getting a decent price on the world market for their tremendous resources, then there would never be a poor African, an uneducated African, an African living in the bush when that African would now be able to live in a decent home, having a decent quality of life. This is what 
Muammar Gaddafi was doing. And the moment he started fostering the African Union as a step towards the United States of Africa, Europe and America came up with NEPAD, the new partnership for Africa's development. That was not working because the countries that you singled out for NEPAD were the strongest in Africa, and you made them promises that you really never intended to deliver. I want to quote to you from the Holy Quran in the chapter 14, verse 22. It says, and the devil will say when the matter is decided. You figure out who that is. Surely Allah promised you a promise of truth. And I promised you then failed you. And I had no authority over you except that I called you and you obeyed me. So blame me not, but blame yourselves. I cannot come to your help, nor can you come to my help. I deny your associating me with Allah before. Surely for the unjust is a painful chastisement. But America and Europe came up with another scheme that Muammar Gaddafi rejected. You wanted to separate the nations of North Africa and unite them with the nations of Southern Europe into a new kind of configuration of nations. All of this to undermine and thwart his efforts to unite Africa, that Africa may come up into the world as an equal partner in world politics, world education, world economics, and world religion. Muammar Gaddafi came up with a system that suits the Libyan and African people, not your parliamentary system, not your system of so-called democracy. You, with your arrogance, think that the people in the Middle East want your democracy when the American people don't have it themselves? And what little they have, they are now losing it with the Patriot Act and the country being under national emergency since 9-11. You, America, throwing stones and hiding your hand as though you are innocent of criminal activity and the nerve of you to put people before the International Criminal Court. How many nations, America, have you seduced to sign a document that they will never bring an American before the ICC? Is there some racism involved in who you put before the International Criminal Court with a record like yours, with a record like Israel's, with a record like those? Why don't any of you and the Israelis for what they did in Gaza, what they did in Lebanon, why don't you bring them before the court? Because America has a veto. It'll never happen. I think there's some racism involved in this since all the cases that you've prosecuted are Africans. Why aren't any one of you before the International Criminal Court? Is this why Muammar Gaddafi, when he came to the United Nations, called the Security Council the Terror Council? Since this Security Council and this United Nation was established in 1945, you said you wanted to bring peace in the world. But there have been 65 different wars since then, and now many more are arising as we speak. Is this your work? then why should we have a United Nations when you have failed to bring about what you said you would bring about in your charter? So has the United Nations lost its legitimate right to exist? In the park across the street from the United Nations, there's a wall with the inscription from Isaiah the prophet that reads, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So your hypocrisy is engraved in granite. So when you look at it and look at the actions of the United Nations, you tell me, is that a worthy institution to continue? The preamble of the Charter of the United States Nations claims that it was being formed to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. But Brother Gaddafi said, quote, terrorism is not only the terrorism of Al Qaeda. The status quo is terrorism. As for now, the Security Council is a feudal security, a feudal policy for permanent members. It protects them and it uses it against us. 
Hence, it should not be called the Security Council, rather the Terror Council. Since the Security Council was established in 1945 and until now, it has not provided security for us, rather provided punishments and terror. Has the United Nations lost its legitimate right to exist? Shouldn't this institution be done away with or completely reformed? But who's got the courage? Who's got the strength? You are weak and cowardly, and you deserve what you get. America is ruled by special interests, not by the needs, rights, and interests of the American people. And you dare to say that the Arab world that is rising wants your democracy? No. They want liberty. They want justice. They want equity. They want a government that serves the needs, rights, and interests of the people. That's what they want. And this is why Muammar Gaddafi said, this is not Egypt. This is not Tunisia. This is not Bahrain. This is not that because he has looked out for the needs, rights, and interests of the Libyan people. That does not mean to say that there's no dissatisfaction in Libya and whether that dissatisfaction is legitimate or not. But if there is dissatisfaction, then let the Libyan people come together and sort out their problems as intelligent, civilized people should do. But it is your intervention. The American people want the same. They're angry with their government. So let me ask this question. Since you said Gaddafi is an illegitimate leader, what is the polling of the American leadership toward their leadership? What is the polling of the American people toward Congress, toward the Supreme Court, toward the executive branch and its leader, the President of the United States? 50% of Americans disapprove of Obama's job performance. Does this mean now that he is illegitimate? Is this why many Americans are saying that he will be a one-term president? 39% of the American people disapprove of the way the Supreme Court is handling its job. 70% of the American people disapprove of Congress. And 61% of the American people believe the country is on the wrong track. But according to what we understand, only 2% of the Libyan people are in rebellion against their government. Now, you mean to tell me that half of your people don't want you? And you dare to say that this man is illegitimate? What makes him illegitimate and what makes you legitimate? Is it because you have ruled the world under white supremacy? Is it because you are former power as a colonial master and a slave master? Is it because of your military might? Well, let me tell you what's about to happen to all of you. I didn't come here just to have a press conference. I came here to preach the doom of this institution. You say he's illegitimate? He kills his own people? What's your record? What's your record, America? Why are American soldiers dying in Iraq, in Afghanistan? Because the former president lied and said that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, that he was an enemy, that he was going to be a threat to the security of America, that he may be connected to Al-Qaeda. So you sent these soldiers to die on the basis of a lie and then washed your hands of responsibility for killing them. How many so-called Libyans can you prove that Gaddafi killed? And how many Americans do we have on the record that your lives has caused their death and the wounding of hundreds of thousands that may never again regain their correct mental state? But you're not the first to do that. American presidents have been lying all along, killing your own people for acquisition of other people's territories, wealth and oil. Tell me that I don't have the record of America's wickedness. See, Zbigniew Brzezinski estimates that in the 20th century, no less than 167 million lives were deliberately extinguished in politically motivated carnage. And you have uh, humanitarian concerns uh, in the front of your mind? Now let me talk to Russia and China. 
If you didn't like Resolution 1973, why did you abstain from voting? None of this would have happened if you had used your veto. So at first, you were condemning this. Now you have joined the voices, voices of the West asking Gaddafi to step down and claiming that he no longer has the moral right to lead the Libyan people. And you said that if he steps down, you will be his protector? That's a joke. Has the West promised you Russia and China some of what they intend to steal from Libya? And I say to my brothers and sisters in Benghazi, if you think they're not planning to use you to steal what's under your foot, not for your benefit, but for the benefit of the Europeans that you will have to praise if you come to power. Ah, their game is always the same. They have never changed, and they have not changed now. The snake may have shed the old skin, but the snake is wearing the same new skin, just looks fresh, new. Well, China and America, I'm sorry if you thought it was wrong. You had the right to bring it back before the Security Council. And you still have the power to do that because you are strong members of the Security Council and you both have the right of veto. The poor African Union, they're today debating. Will you listen to the African Union who has a legitimate right to ask you to stop the bombing of Libya? Will you listen? I doubt it. But now um, Africa, I mean America, I'm sorry, China and Russia, you've joined the rest of them. So now you must share in their fate. You may think it's your move, but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the God that is on scene today is so wise, he turns men's mind to thinking and doing as he pleases because he and he alone is Maliki Yaumidin. He's master of this day of requital in which we are now living. So the moves that you now make that make you think you are safe and secure, keep looking at the chessboard. And soon you will see your pieces coming off the table. Your governments will soon be laying in ruin. And some of you who have plotted against the peoples of the world will be seen on the back of pickup trucks driving through the streets of America and the American people throwing stones and raw garbage at you. This is what you're facing. And it is written in the Quran that the mother town should be warned. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the mother town is Mecca itself. Well, what is wrong in Mecca that it needs to be warned? And who will do the warning? So all of you are facing the wrath of God that you talk about, but you don't know him. But you will soon be very well acquainted with him because he wants to make himself known by what he does in America. No foreign power will deal with this country. America will be dealt with by God himself and his use of the forces of nature. Right. Now, NATO, I, I know you can check your watch, but I'm not going to stop till I'm finished. I, I really don't care what you write. I don't care what you say. I'm making a statement. You can take it or leave it. NATO and America are trying to recolonize Africa through AFRICOM. My question to African leaders is, will you allow it out of fear of the so-called power of the West? Will you bow down and carry out their will, which is against your best interest and the interest of African people worldwide? If African leaders don't stand up today, then you will find yourself facing the wrath of the fast awakening African people. Look at the arrogance of Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, speaking in Addis Ababa, the capital of the African Union. That's some gall to go right to us and tell us like children what she wants us to do. See, this is your arrogance and your hypocrisy that will end your world. Let me tell you what she said. 
It is true, over many years, Gaddafi played a major role in providing financial support for many African nations and institutions, including the African Union. But it has become clearer by the day that he has lost his legitimacy to rule, and we are long past time when he can or should remain in power. What you're saying, Mrs. Clinton, is for yourself. Your legitimacy is gone. And maybe you and those like you have lost your legitimacy and you soon will not be in power. Listen to what she said. I urge all African states to call for a genuine ceasefire and to call for Gaddafi to step aside. I also urge you to suspend the operations of Gaddafi's embassies in your countries to expel pro-Gaddafi diplomats and to increase contact and support for the Transitional National Council. America has done nothing for Africa. You dare send this woman there to talk to Africans like they're your children? Let me tell you something, Africa. If you accept that, you deserve what you get. In closing, in the book of Ezekiel, third chapter, the Son of Man is instructed to warn the wicked and let the wicked know that if they don't turn from their wicked ways, they will surely die. But if the Son of Man fears the wicked and will not warn them, they will die in their wickedness, but their blood will be required at his hand. I'm acting in that capacity as I speak. I warn the wicked, which I'm doing today. And I'm telling you, if you don't turn from your wicked ways, then you still will die. But I have preserved my soul because I've gotten your blood off my hands. I want to announce to you that the period of grace that God has given for America and this Western world to repent is over. And the full chastisement of Almighty God is going to come down on all of you. I'm speaking like this inside America with no arms and no army. But I warned you 15 years ago in the first anniversary of the Million Man March in front of the United Nations before over 40,000 people. And we called all the nations to atonement for murder, yeah. violence, and war. But the UN has not atoned. Murder is on the increase, violence is on the increase, war is on the increase, and the sale of weapons of war and the making of even more horrible weapons of war is on the increase. So you're in it now. You can't escape. The die is set. The judgment of God is here. And that which you depend on for your existence, he's turning it against you. I warned you then, and now this is the final warning. You did not heed it, so this is absolutely your end. Thank you for listening. Minister Farrakhan will now take uh, questions. If you would please uh, kindly state your name and affiliation. Um, the minister, is, he wrote a letter that uh, to the leader of the Libyan revolution, and he wants to read that letter to you before we start the questions. Be patient for a minute. Thank you. I thought I would make it an open letter because I don't want my government to think that I would be writing their nemesis words that I wouldn't share with you. So you'll never be able to say I did something in secret. So this is my letter to Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, it reads as follows. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear Brother Leader Muammar Gaddafi, may this letter find you, your family, and the faithful people of the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya in the best of health and spirit in spite of the prevailing circumstances. Please accept on behalf of myself, my family, the members of the Nation of Islam, and all in America whom you have helped our deepest sympathy on the loss of life of your son and three grandchildren. It is written in the Holy Quran that no soul dies but with the permission of Allah. We may not know Allah's purpose in permitting what is happening in Libya, 
But again, Allah says in the Holy Quran, whenever a misfortune befalls the believer, he says, Allah is my patron and to him is my eventual return. I am deeply, deeply troubled over what I see happening to our beloved Libya and our brother leader, Muammar Gaddafi. We are drinking of the bitter cup of betrayal, which is prophesied to come to us in the last days of this wicked world, to separate from among us those whom Allah, God, will use in the building of his kingdom and those who are marked for severe chastisement and utter destruction. I observed those whom you trusted, Prime Minister Berlusconi of Italy, President Sarkozy of France, Prime Minister Cameron of the United Kingdom, and President Obama of the United States of America, who have joined forces with the weak Arabs from the Arab League and others to join the enemies of righteousness and justice to destroy you and the revolution that brought about the rise of Libya into her present strength and greatness. These betrayals hurt deeply, but probably not as much as the betrayals from within your inner circle. Mm -hmm. To hear that Russia and China, supposed friends, are now asking you to step down, and the president of Russia promising you their protection and a place for you to go, this to me is laughable. Anyone who will ask you to step down, step aside, and leave the country because of what America, NATO, and others are doing does not understand the resolve of a true Muslim. Allah warns us in the Holy Quran, O oh, you who believe, take not my enemy and your enemy for friends. Would you offer them love while they deny the truth that has come to you, driving out the messenger and yourselves because you believe in Allah, your Lord? If you have come forth to strive in my way and seek my pleasure, would you love them in secret? And I know what you conceal and what you manifest. And whoever of you does this, he indeed strays from the straight path. Allah and Allah alone is your and my protector. The Holy Quran teaches only Allah is your friend and his messenger and those who believe. We know that Allah and his messenger are our true friends, but we do not know who the believers are until they have been tried and found to be true. My dear brother leader, in the general orders that we were given, by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, whose desire was to make us brave fighters, willing at any time to give our lives for Allah's sake and righteousness, it states in General Order Number 5, do not quit your post until properly relieved. Allah put you on your post, and neither NATO, the President of the United States, or the Arab League, or anybody else has the power or authority to tell you to quit your post. Elijah Muhammad told me, die on your post. These next few words, again, from the Holy Quran are for the believers. It is written in the Holy Quran, Surely I'm going to try you with something of fear, hunger, loss of property, loss of life, and diminution of fruit, but give good news to those who are patient and steadfast under trial. Again, Allah asks the question in the Holy Quran, do men think that they will be left alone on saying, we believe and will not be tried? And indeed, we tried those before them, so Allah will certainly know those who are true, and he will know the liars. In the life of Prophet Noah, he was under such great strain, he asked Allah, when will my help come? And Allah answered, your help is nigh. Your help, brother leader, is nigh. Be patient and be resolved that it is Allah and Allah alone who will deliver you and me as he delivered those before us from the wicked, evil intentions and harm from our enemies. I know 
that what you are suffering will soon come to me, Louis Farrakhan, and the nation of Islam. And I pray that the guidance that I give to you, that Allah will make me and us strong enough to be that as Allah has asked the believers to be. In closing, the last two surahs of the Holy Quran are called the chapters of refuge. And my plea to you is to seek refuge in Allah and know that if it pleases Allah, he will deliver you and with you the Libyan Jamahiriya. My dearest of brothers, know that no death can touch Muammar Gaddafi, for it is written in the Holy Quran, quote, and speak not of those who are slain in Allah's way as dead. Nay, they are alive, but you perceive not. The great work that you have done will live regardless to what happens. The work you have started by Allah's grace will be furthered by those who love you and those who know the value of what you have contributed to Libya, Africa, and the world. Remember, brother, Allah says he will never waste the work of a worker. I will do all that I can to help, but Allah's help is sufficient. Thank you for reading these words, and I pray that in these words you'll find comfort, solace, guidance, and strength in the words of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Give my greeting to your beloved wife and family and to the faithful ones whose faith is being greatly tested. With much love, I greet you again in peace. Wa alaikum salam. I am your brother and servant, Louis Farrakhan. Thank you. <laughs> now you may continue. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Farrakhan, my name is Nellie Hester Bailey. I am from uh, WHCR Radio 90.3 FM in Harlem and Black Agenda Report, an internet uh, radio program. Sir, uh, despite NATO's uh, being in violation of UN Resolution 1973 and the US Congress cutting off funding for the war, NATO appears to be determined to carry out the murder of Muammar Gaddafi. What will that impact if, in fact, it occurs? What is that impact on Libya, on the region, and the upcoming presidential election, specifically the re-election of President Obama? You know, I had something in my talk that I don't know whether I mentioned it. It's about Brother Barack. And uh, this is what I said. I said, dear brother, be careful about the assassination of Muammar Gaddafi and others in the Muslim world. Could it be that while you and your staff are planning the death of Muammar Gaddafi? Could it also be that members of your own Democratic Party are plotting to betray you? Could it be that right now, while you are planning for your second term, that there are those in your party that don't want you for a second term, and definitely the Republicans want you to be a one-term president? So like Abraham Lincoln, who was prosecuting the Civil War and doubted that he would be reelected, won a second term. But this so angered the opposition that it was then that his own reelection inspired his assassination. Could that be going on right now under your own nose? Think, dear brother, before you act, because as the Bible puts it, God is not mocked, as a man soweth, the same shall he also reap. And as Obadiah the prophet said, as thou hast done, so shall it be done unto you. If they're successful in killing Brother Gaddafi, this is not going to be the end. This is the beginning of horrors, as you will see. 
Gaddafi wasn't in some tent twiddling his thumbs. He was working for the good of the African people. The African people will rise. NATO, and I'm sorry, America, I would, I gotta say it, you know, because I heard it from the mouth of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. <clears throat> Europe is finished. All of you that love war, you'll be drowned in your own blood, as it is written. Those of you who love to shed the blood of others, Allah will make you drunk with your own blood as with sweet wine. Europe is headed for war as we speak. Yes, England, France, Italy, Germany. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told me that at the right time to tell you that Europe is the graveyard of the future. And all of you that ran to Europe to your former colonial masters, it is written that everyone will have to go to their own and find refuge under their own vine and fig tree. And as Europe is trying to push out the Africans, push out the Pakistanis, you would be wise to prepare yourself to get out of there or die there because the future for Europe and America is bleak. Very, very bleak. China and Russia, oh, you all will be in war. You like it, so Allah is going to give it to you. You'll have war soon. Mark my words, not my words, the words of a man who was taught by God, and you will face every word that he spoke, and you remember what you heard today, that a man, a real man of God, was in your midst, and every word that I speak, you will face it. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Masood Heather. I represent Daily Dawn of Pakistan. Minister, I'd like to know, since you have issued a all virtual indictment of United Nations, and also uh, you have suggested that there could be a way to stop the NATO attacks into uh, uh, Libya, what is it that you envision? In place of United Nations, what is it that can be created <laughs> that can replace it? Are you a Muslim? And what? Yes, Are sir. you a Muslim? Yes, sir. Good. And, well, the, the, other, yes. and the other thing I want to know, why, how do you uh, envision that there could be another resolution that can be brought about and stop this war in Libya? Well, I'm not familiar with all your twists and turns of the United Nations, but Russia and China have great strength. And they could bring this thing back before the United Nations and argue that NATO and America have exceeded what UN Resolution 1973 authorized them to do and take another vote and stop this. They could do that. Now, what will replace the United Nations? This is a sham. So I ask you a question if you believe in Allah, if you're a Muslim, because it's written that Allah himself is going to set up a kingdom on this earth of peace and justice. So all this happening is to remove all of this fictitious dream of a few that rule the many, that they will continue their rule. Their time is up. I'll say it again loud and clear. Your time to rule is up and your rule will end in war, and America's power will be broken in war. These are the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that I am entrusted with to speak. Now mark those words down and watch. I've given you tomorrow's headlines today. Uh, yes, Brother Minister, my yes. name is Dashan Farad. I represent the Amsterdam News. I would like to know, do you feel that President Obama is being motivated by unseen forces to attack Libya? There is no doubt. When Brother Gaddafi went into office, look at the sweetness of that man in his heart. Everybody that wanted change in America just about fell in love with this man. And that is what he actually wanted to do. But look who he's surrounded with. He brought around him in economics 
the crowd from Goldman Sachs. What does that mean? He's not an economist. He's a lawyer by profession. So he trusted economists, and they, uh, I would say they persuaded him to get a bailout. Did the bailout bail us out, or it, did it bail out Wall Street? See? So no, he's surrounded by the people that are Zionist-controlled or Zionists. In fact, when he was elected, a Jewish man in Chicago said that as Clinton was the first black president, Obama is the first Jewish president. Now, you can take it or leave it. He was not elected to serve a black agenda or to do good for us. He was served, he was voted in to be the black face on a white agenda. And he's not escaping it. He's caught up in it and will pay the consequences for it. Thank you. Take two more questions. Thank you for taking the time to record US crimes. Uh, my name is Sarah Flounders from the International Action Center. And if you could uh, please comment uh, more on the role of AFRICON in really the recolonization and plans for new wars in Africa. I guess just as America planted Israel in the Middle East, and there has not been any peace in the Middle East ever since Israel was established, now she's planting AFRICOM in Africa, not for the purpose of helping Africa. See, the enemy always comes in with so-called good intentions. That's how he deceives you. He speaks the right word, but his actions do not follow the good that's in his words. And AFRICOM is definitely a plant in Africa, using a black face to start this, to make it acceptable. This is why they use Colin Powell to say to the UN that um, uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, they use a black man that had a good track record. Yes, go so you could trust his word. But he set the CIA behind him yes. because he was not sure that their intelligence was right. Mm -hmm. And America, instead of following truth, and making policy according to truth, she twisted the truth to follow her policy. And so, uh, my dear um, young lady, um, uh, I don't see, I really don't see um, the United Nations being able to settle anything because now the whole world sees her for what she really is. And imagine all the little nations looking at her, seeing what she's doing. Now, some are going to cow down in fear because America and Europe's powers are so great. They fear that they can be wiped out like they feel Brother Gaddafi is going to be wiped out. Suppose he survives. I mean, look, it's going 90 days now. He survived. I saw him playing chess. They said, I don't know if that's an old picture. It's a new picture. New picture yes. Well, see, I mentioned the chess board. <laughs> Suppose he survives. What then? What about the future of Europe and its dependence on that crude oil? Will he sell it to them? See, he, got the, he got a good heart. Really. I sat with my brother some years ago. And I said, Brother Gaddafi, do not trust these people. I said, they want to get close to you to destroy your revolution and to destroy you. He patted me on my thigh, never said a word. But I said, I'm warning you, brother, this is their intention. When he opened the door, they came in, and they came in to destroy him. And since you're from Pakistan, brother, the West is very afraid of Pakistan's nuclear capability. They love a weak man in power. Nawaz Sharif, who was elected 
by the people was a stronger man. And he was overthrown. And Musharraf was brought in. And Musharraf appeared to be too strong too. So you have who you have. And you have what you have. So Pakistan better rise up. And remember that this is not your friend. They're not a friend of Islam. And any pretext that will give them the chance to go in and try to take all your nuclear capabilities, this is what they're after. And they only need any pretext. And so be careful, Pakistan. You're a great nation. But remember, Satan is always busy seducing the righteous. I hope I helped in answering your question. Two more, and that's it. Yours and the next one. That's the last one. Oh, this is the last one. OK, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister uh, Muhammad. Uh, my name is Donald Wingfield. I'm with the Black Star News. Uh, you already have given uh, Obama uh, not to, to not to go into uh, Libya, and they went in anyway. What should the uh, African people be doing today, right now, to stand up in the streets to stop uh, this White House to cease and desist from going any further attacks into uh, Libya? Thank you. Since we're coming up on a new election season, and my sister is organizing a huge rally in Harlem. See, we have to stir African people. And they have to know what is going on that is damaging to African interests. And if we rise as a people, particularly in an election season, and let our brother know you can't count on our vote if this is what you're going to do, we put you in power to be a good man. And you have allowed these satanic minds to hook you in. So the book of Revelation said he's like a frog in the mouth of a dragon. You hear the frog, beep, 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 but it ain't the frog. It's the dragon talking through the frog. He's not in power. He acts in power, but the powers are behind him. And you ought to know it. Any black man that stands up for white concerns is backed by powers that you don't see, but he feels it. And that's why he acts and reacts the way he does. You better wake up, black people, and not be deceived by the fact that a black man is in the White House. It's great that he's there if what he does there helps us all. Now, he's done something for gays. He's done something for unions. He's done something for this one, something for that one. Let's see what he does for black people and for Africa, not sending Hillary Clinton to Addis Ababa to Tell Africans what to do, the nerve of her. And believe me, if she sent, well, he, he may have okayed it. But who sent her? Y'all better wake up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister Louis Farrakhan, thank you. Here, sir.